Hello there and welcome back listeners. You're listening to Wendy Harris at Making Conversations Count. And I'm so pleased to continue to bring you super human people in their field. And today is no different to any other episode where I am joined with a guy who quite literally has a superpower in working with a bunch of clowns. As we're making conversations about leadership training count. So what's new, Wendy Wu? Well, in light of the fact that Jay worked with clowns, I thought it was worth giving you a tip that would make you smile. Because when you're picking up the phone to strangers, there's a very good chance that you're never going to get through. So let's have a little bit of fun. When you get to speak to aka the gatekeeper, and if you read any of my social media blogs, you'll know that I really despise that term. So let's say you speak to Aunt Mabel who answers the phone and that person's on holiday. Think of something playful you can say, like, or oh, where have they gone somewhere glamorous? It's likely you'll get a response that you can take note of. And when you get to speak to that person, you can ask them if they had a great time. Jay Guilford worked at the Cirque du Soleil and he is just superhuman when it comes to leadership programmes that creates organic development and improves performance. You're going to love Jay. He has so much warmth. And when you get to his pivotal moment, boy, have some really powerful stuff. Joining me from his big top. I am so excited to have you here. I saw reference to Cirque du Soleil. It was perhaps the first show that I ever went to that had me on such an emotional roller coaster that yeah. I was literally trying not to wet my pants because okay. I was laughing so much to crying with such sadness and emotion. And I bought so to slay masks and they're in the house and people admire them still. And that must be 15, 20 years ago. Yeah. The magic that comes about from those shows is just awesome. So to know that you were associated with such you know, such a name. <laughs> yeah. I, I tell people, Wendy, I tell them I worked with a bunch of clowns. That's my opening line, mostly. I can't say that I've been in such company of prestigious clowns, <laughs> but certainly I can take the reference. <laughs> you created the Spark program. So mm-hmm. tell me a little bit more about how that came about. I came to Cirque du Soleil from the world of training and teaching. So when I came to Cirque, I immediately had my learning and development hat on. And I worked with numbers of executives before training corporate teams. When I went to Cirque du Soleil, I saw that they had things down pat, like collaboration, communication, trust, cross-cultural communication. And I was like, wow, other corporations can learn this, but in such a unique way. So over the course of my six plus years at Cirque, what I did was we strapped executives into Cirque du Soleil apparatuses and we flew them <laughs> across our training rooms, yeah, and our studios. And that it wasn't just fun and games, Wendy, it was actually to right. teach them collaboration, communication and trust and healthy risk taking in real time. Because you could imagine we had like Google, Adobe, Microsoft, MasterCard. These executives had access to like any type of training session they wanted something different. And with CERC, the teams at CERC helped me to deliver that. So mostly the teams at CERC did it. And I just stood up with the microphone and said, come on in. <laughs> <laughs> so you were the ringmaster then, really? Create the curriculum and the concept. I mean, we all worked together. So I, I spearheaded the creation of the program. It was a lot of fun. It was just a lot of fun and very impactful. Well, I can see why, because as a trainer myself, I've really through these COVID times, I've really suffered because that one-on-one, that being in physical 
proximity yeah. you know being able to be in that interactive that's what we we've kind of missed and for me when I've been to somebody else's training program because I'm interested in a different topic or you're learning a, a new skill that's fine to sit and learn to an extent but when you're really involved in something God, it goes in here and it goes in here, doesn't it? It goes in your head, it goes in your heart, and it's truly memorable. And I think using the circus sort of taps into that childlike learning that we forget as we grow up. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's what's interesting to me about learning is that we think learning is pencil and paper, but mostly everything we do in the world, we learn through experience. We learn to drive, we learn to fall in love, we learn to cook. Uh, we learned to fall out of love. <laughs> we learned it all through experience. So I've always approached learning, even now at CoWorks Leadership Strategist, my organization, I approach learning through an experiential basis because talking about something doesn't teach it. Well, this is it. You don't learn to drive in the classroom, do you? You have to actually get in the car and try not to hit anybody. Yeah, maybe. Let me think. <laughs> But this is the thing, isn't it? You know, it's kind of like we forget this and we live in a society, I think, where we're meant to be perfect at everything the first time. Yes. You know, everything's on tap to us. People say to me, I had the conversation with Brad Sugars. Oh, cold calling doesn't work. You know, I can't phone people up because, it, you know, nobody wants to speak to me. Well, how many did you do? Well, I rang about five people. And you go, well, what do you expect? Yeah, did you really try? <laughs> yeah. Five. I've, I'm getting on for close to like two million calls. Wow. I'm not going to have ever converted two million people to buy the stuff, but at least I've attempted it. It's the starting point. So when you're doing your leadership now, Jay, what sort of leadership are you doing without the tightropes? I still have a good relationship with Cirque du Soleil, let's say. I left four years ago to found CoWorks Leadership Strategist. And what we do is we enter organizations on the highest levels of leadership, really, so that we can make those changes. So what I do is I work with executives and usually the chief human resources officer or the highest person in HR. And we understand what the organization needs and then create training that delivers what they need. So we use a lot of data-driven assessments, and then we use a lot of experiential learning uh, uh, stuff. And everything we do is original. So it's not like you're gonna Google any of the activities that we have, because I've created them all. Out of my frustration, just like you, that you have to learn through experience. So, you know, we've worked with places like the Empire State Building, uh, some divisions of Procter & Gamble, uh, some nonprofits like Point Foundation. I've worked with uh, executives from Disney. You know, fortunately, because I did the thing at Cirque, I have a calling card and people have called me. But what we really try to do is work with executives to understand what they need to transform personally and then understand what their teams need and then deliver like, not just my opinion, but scientifically validated approaches to help them make those changes. That's the key thing is that everybody's individual. You know, what I've seen is that a lot of those high powered executives, they really got to their position because they had a, a lot of drive and a lot of go get itness. And sometimes I have to tell them, hold on, dude, you got there because of that. But now you have a team of 5,000 people you don't need to do that anymore. Like you're already at the top. You don't need to claw. And, and I understand why you felt like you need it. So, but you got to calm down. So that's really what I go in to do is I, I go in to calm those executives down, teach them those soft skills and be a sounding board. Because you can imagine that if you're the person in the building whose name is on the building, you may not be getting that feedback from people because they're intimidated. So I can go in and say those tough things in ways that they can understand and hear. Yeah, sure. And I'm guessing... Does these programs sort of sort the wheat from the chaff? Because it's one thing going from being a doer of all these things to leading in all these things. You're going to have people that are going to be like the leaders of tomorrow or potentially go on to do their own company or, or it's not a good fit. Do you find it sort of sits in two camps or is there another camp? Well, I, what I've seen is that for the executives who already kind of own the products or the, they're the C-level of the organization, 
Now, what they're working to do is to empower others and not do it all themselves. They got there because they had all the answers. So part of what I have to do and what I love to do is to say, you got to empower your team. You got to delegate some authority, not just tasks. And you have to sit back. We just talked about this, Wendy. You have to sit back and let people make mistakes. So that's what I'm telling yes. the executives. And for the team members, I often train management teams, like you said, who want to become those powerful executives. What's really important is not the technical skill stuff. Anybody can learn the stuff on Google or how to use some specific program. It's really going to be the soft skills. And I know people, it's, it's really going to be, are you emotionally intelligent enough to manage a distributed workforce now? Because now they're all around the country, around the world. Now, do you have the emotional intelligence to do that virtually? That's not a technical skill. It's an emotional skill. How do you give feedback to somebody when they're not in person? So that's really what we're working on. What's been the biggest shift then with this remote working that you've seen in not just delivering, but supporting through the programs? The biggest, besides speaking into the black box of Zoom three times. <laughs> I, I know you do this a lot, but the biggest shift is really building, helping organizations build a culture when you don't see each other face to face. What's been, and I'm gonna say this, and this is gonna be unpopular, but I'm the dude who says the unpopular things. The technology is not the only answer. So I, it is really great that we have all of these platforms and resources. What we're missing is that 80% of communication that happens through body language. So Wendy, as you look at me and I look at you, you're not seeing anything below my shoulders. So you don't know that I have on pajama pants, first of all. <laughs> but <geez. laughs> I hope but, you've got your slippers on. I do have my slippers on. But you miss that communication, that body language. So what I talk to executive leaders about is that when you're delivering difficult feedback or a challenging message, or you're talking about a change, you can't see if somebody's twiddling their thumbs or cringing with their hands, or if they have their body crossed from below the shoulders. So on their face, they might be smiling and happy, or they might have their camera turned off so you can't see anything, but you're missing all of that other communication. So that's been the goal for me is to help leaders think about how do you communicate these messages and what do you need to do when you can't get that other information? That's really interesting, Jay, because for me as a telemarketer of 30-odd uh -huh. years, my left ear is highly tuned. So for me, having a, you know, having a telephone conversation with somebody, I can almost hear body language. Yes. And I think that's what we're missing is if we could – pretends that we were not on Zoom now and we were just having a telephone conversation, I would have to really concentrate because I've only got that one skill to be able to communicate with you. So already, if I just close my eyes and imagine, everything shifts. And we're not, we're not training enough people in this ability to be disabled What's been really interesting about communication is that it's mostly about listening. Yes. I, one thing, and this is a tip that I give to leaders and anyone who's listening can take it is, are you listening for the pause to insert your message or are you listening to the message that's, that you should be receiving? And a lot of times, mostly we're listening to the pause to say our thing. Just one quick skill is if you were to come with notes and a sheet of paper and your job is to really understand only what they're saying and reflect back to them, you will see that communication goes much better. You're right, Wendy, listening is a skill that leaders have to learn now. And in lots of respects, it's not what that is being said, but how it is being said. So that inflection and tone, if you really know your team, you'll hear if there's something else going on. Because there's a sort of disconnect, there's a disengage in their voice. Because you can tell that they're off daydreaming or looking out the window and they're not really listening to you. Yes. We've lost so many of these like soft skills by not using one tool, which is the telephone. That's my view. 
Yes. So it's great that you still champion the listening techniques. It's necessary. I mean, I said, and sometimes we hide the ball. I've had so many in these coaching and training sessions, leaders will say, well, I feel like they're not telling me everything. Great. So you can tell them, what are you not telling me? What are some things that you're not saying to me? But we don't know that we can ask that because we haven't been in this world where the verbal communication has been much more important because we're losing all of the in-person feedback we get. So you have to know how to use those words. And you're right, Wendy, it's also about the inflection. A leader can say, what else are you not telling me? Because they're frustrated. Or they can say, oh, what else are you not telling me? Yeah. And though this is a very different message. Yeah. Very different message. And, and if you really listen hard, you'll know whether you've been told a tall tale when you know them really well. My daughter told me a lie. And so I, I turned it into a, a social media post. Of, Don't ever tell a lie because you'll be caught out. And a lie will catch up with you. And months and months ago, I said, where's your lunchbox? Oh, I don't know. Well, you took it to school. You brought it back from school. Yes. So where is it then? I don't know. <laughs> I found it in her bedroom months later. There's a science experiment happening in that lunchbox. <laughs> but the point of it was because I can hear that she didn't want to tell me something. She didn't want me to hear the truth she kind of skirted around it. I could tell. I just couldn't prove it. Yeah. And, and I think this is another thing that we, when we trust what we're hearing of our own instincts, we can make better decisions as well, can't we, in how to handle things. I love that word trust because it's important. Not, I mean, I work with a lot of leaders and organizations. It's important for us all in this brave new world of how we're communicating and living, even though things are quote unquote going back to normal, they've changed in a lot of senses. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that idea of trust and the way we're going to communicate is really important. And when you're in positions of power, like a parent over a child or an executive over a, another employee, because they, the person you're in power over, they recognize the power. Sometimes they feel like they need to lie to you to protect themselves. Lying is, is not necessarily morally wrong. It's a protection mechanism. It's like, if I say the truth, I feel like I'm going to get in trouble. If I tell mommy that I'm having a science experiment in my lunchbox, she <laughs> might. Yeah, Wendy doesn't yell at her kids, I know, but other parents yell at their Let's kids. Say we can have it for lunch, you know, skip to meal. So that's why even as leaders, a part of what's going to happen with your team is that they're probably not going to tell you the truth sometimes because you're afraid of the power that might come down on them. So that's just a part of it, too. You know, we all I've told a few lies in my life, maybe five or six. So, and I'm, <laughs> I'm just going to test you on what those five or six are. Was it five or was it six, Jay? Well, it was seven. <laughs> it is interesting. And I think what you're touching on really, you know, body language, communication, it's about that connectivity, isn't it, with people? Yeah. And for me, conversation is, is kind of everything that I do, everything boils down to that. You've got to be a clear communicator to do well in helping and supporting people. Yeah, that's been something I've had to learn over the course of my 15 plus years, I don't want to date myself, but I have 15 plus years working with leaders is how to communicate clearly. What, because I came from a really academic background, I would talk in these long sentences. And because I started to work with global teams, sometimes English was their third language. And those long sentences lost them. It's not that they didn't understand me. They spoke many languages. It's just, I was just not talking right. So Wendy, what I did was I started to read children's books. Surprisingly, I bought a lot of children's readers. And because those books communicate messages about morality, those really abstract concepts to seven-year-olds in a yeah. way that they understand, it helped me to clarify my communication. Like, get to the point. What are you trying to say? Why are you trying to say it? What are the simplest words? You don't have to go to the thesaurus and get all extra, you know, harvard -y or Yale or whatever, wherever school people go to. But what is the clearest way to say it? No, it's true, isn't it? There are a lot of marketers will say, if you can get your point across so that a seven-year-old understands it, you've nailed it. 
And nobody wants a thesaurus for breakfast. No, <laughs> no, maybe for lunch, not for breakfast. <laughs> uh, you know, bedtime reading, maybe. What would your top tip be for those starting out in terms of communication and leading themselves? Oh, the top tip, the, today's top tip, because it's going to change. I'll be on another, another podcast and I'll say something different. Today in my heart, the top tip is authenticity. Uh, it's something that I've had to learn. Early in my career, I did things because, oh, I needed a job or I wanted this amount of money or I wanted the prestige of a certain set of things. And that was different from being my authentic self. So early on, especially when you're younger, there, the world forgives you for a lot of stuff. Like if you're in your 20s, you can be sleeping on a couch or, you know, like hopping from job to job. And you have a lot of leeway because you're 20 something and not 40 something like, like me. I think everyone has a lot of leeway, but when you're younger, it's easier to take those chances. So for younger listeners, be your authentic self. Think about what you really want to do and go do that. Don't worry about money because one, it's just printed paper or now it's just even a number on a screen. So it's not even paper anymore. And two, when you're living authentically, all of the other resources will come. So decide what you want to do, what you care about and do that. That's really good advice. And authenticity is kind of a buzzword that everybody uses. It's not always used in the right context. And I think you've just nailed it. It's okay to be you. And we've been told that certain types of people or certain ways of being are not appropriate. Like we're giving these two sets of messages, like you should be, you should not chase money, but being rich is great. Yeah. Why do they have all those resources? So it's just really important for you to clear the clutter and the easiest thing to do is to be yourself because then you just are yourself wherever you go. I, I mean, I feel like I just learned that like four minutes ago, like be yourself. And then for young people, I would also say, you know, when a situation is not right for you, like whether it's a relationship or work or a meal you order that you don't like the taste of, you know, what's not right for you. You're not beheld to stay at a job. I, I mean, I've informally coached friends who've been in work situations and they're like, I'm like, you don't like it. You don't like the work situation. Get another one. There's, you don't have to stay there. Well, I just got the job. You don't like it. Go to where you like. Someone else is going to like that job. When you leave, someone else will come in and they'll like it. And then you go somewhere where you like. So young people know what you want, know what you don't want and just go for it. Go for it. Yeah. The judgment of other people is what's going to hold you back. And ultimately, that judgment that's coming from other people is probably not even happening because people don't care. Nobody, well, yes. <laughs> what's the quote? What's the quote? It's like, you would care less about what people think about you when you realize how seldom they do. <laughs> yeah, of course. Everybody's worrying about what you're doing today, Jay, and whether you like it or not. And are you good at it? You know, how many yeah. billion people on the planet are all worrying about that right now? Oh, Said no. Nobody ever. <laughs> No one is. No. I mean, it's. It, I remember uh, I used to say, I'm going to show them. I'm going to show them. And then I realized they're not looking. No, it's only you looking, yeah. isn't it? That's the thing. So so a good friend and mentor said, you know, look in the mirror. The eyes that you look out of are what you have always looked out at. Things might change around you, but who you are at the core of you, has always looked out at those eyes. So think back to a time when you remember it being great. Think of a situation that you really enjoyed and it will find you again. Yes. Getting deep, Jay. Come on, get the clowns back out. It's exactly what I've been practicing and what I, you know, it's just my life's practice is what I tell leaders. It's like, even when there is a problem in the midst of something that feels like chaos, if you literally look around you, everything is going well. If you literally look around you, you know, you're in traffic. Mostly people aren't bumping into each other with their cars. The sun is shining or the clouds are raining or all of the structures that we've built are standing Mostly everything's going well. So it's not a myth. Positivity and optimism is not a myth. It's just 
I remember I was talking to a leader of an organization and he was feeling stressed and someone brought him a cup of water. And I said, do you know how much had to go well for that water to get to you? Like the glass had to be clean. It didn't break. The person was trustworthy. When people bring us food, they didn't poison you. You just don't even think about that. The tap water had to be clean. Like these people had to come to work. A million things had to go well just for you to get that water. Everything is going well, Wendy. Like you said, we are getting deep. So maybe we should take it down a notch. But <laughs> everyone, that's the message of the day on Wendy's uh, podcast. So authenticity, I like it. That's it. That's the best place to start, isn't it? Yes. Best place to start. Thank you for sharing a little bit about what you do and how you help people, Jay. I really, really love where you come from with your work. We're going to carry on that conversation in just a moment. But first... I ask everybody that comes on the show to think of a conversation that counted for them. So if you like, one that they can go, oh, if that hadn't have happened, no change would have occurred. Can you think of something that you can share with us now? Oh, which one? The one that comes to mind was a conversation where I was in an organization working with the president of an organization and I walked into a meeting and in this meeting, he was to turn over leaders that I would be leading for a client activation that they paid a significant amount of money for. So I walk into the meeting with these leaders I'd never met before. And Wendy, I would say not two minutes into the conversation, he started to curse me out. He just started to yell at the top of his lungs and he just dropped F-bomb after F-bomb after F-bomb. And at this moment, Wendy, I am a trained mediator. I had seen these situations before. So I started to go into mediation mode. And I'm like, Mr. President, I see that you're angry, Mr. President. How can we work this out, Mr. President? Tell me. And he just said, get the out of his office. And I left. And I would like to say that I left and I, you know, I got some tea and I gathered myself, but I, I, I cried for a couple of hours. And what was interesting about this was I had all the tools. Like I had been Ivy League trained to deal with this type of stuff. I'd worked with Fortune 500 leaders and this guy was not a Fortune 500 leader. So I had been trained to deal with this and yet I was paralyzed emotionally. Fortunately, because I did have the skills, I went back the next day and I said, let's review our conversation. Help me to understand why you felt like it was okay for you to speak to me that way. What was going on? And he gave me some information. I understood that there was some stuff happening in the business and with him that was stressful. And he walked in, in that day in that meeting with that stuff. And then after he said all of that, I said, all of that, I understand. In, the way, in terms of the way we're going to communicate, this is what I expect. These things cannot occur not only because they hurt me, they did hurt my feelings and I cried, but also they're gonna impact our activation for the client and your team in this way. So it was, what did that conversation open up for me? It helped me to see that, well, Wendy, this is gonna be counterintuitive, but it helped me to see that even leaders at the highest level didn't have the skills they needed. So it opened up empathy for me, surprisingly, because I realized I was like that guy after I cried for, right after he cursed me, after I cried for a few hours, I thought I was like, that guy didn't just wake up, receive a million dollar check from Bill and Melinda Gates, you know, kiss his spouse goodbye, get in his Ferrari and then decide to curse me out. I was like, something's not going well. And when I uncovered what wasn't going well, it made it all the more clear to me that we all need this help in communicating better and managing our emotions. So it was a conversation that really was painful. And it was a conversation that helped me to understand that we need some help and learning to communicate. And we all need to exercise more empathy. And we all need to learn some emotional <laughs> control. I can totally, totally get on board with what you're saying there, that I was working for a guy who I would prepare minutes after meetings and I would uh, type them all up to go on file and for letters to go out many years ago. And it was kind of one of those jobs where I, I needed the job. 
I, I had bills to pay. This was a long time ago. And I was doing it around building my business. So we're going back 17 years. So, And he would read back the minutes and say, that's not what I said. <sighs> and he would shout at me. And I'm like, my notes don't lie. Right. And he'd say, well, I said this, 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 and this, and it was completely different. And I, and it got to the point where after a couple of weeks of, of being barked at, I was just like, I can't stand this. And there was a couple of things really that came from it was one, I didn't know that his wife wanted to leave him. Exactly. So we can't see what's going on in people's lives. We can only see what's going on now in front of us. And the other point was that because he was a multimillionaire and everybody called him Mr., right, not by his first name, Mm -hmm. Mr., everybody was scared of him. So he could act exactly how he wanted to. He'd created this persona. And I went in one day and went, I can't continue to work here if this is what you're going to doubt me, if you're going to, you know, make me so upset that I don't want to come when all I want to do is help you. And all he was looking for was for for me to stand up to him. He was always looking for somebody to stand up to him. And as soon as I did, I was allowed to call him by his first name. Yes. That's it, Wendy. That's the message, message, message. Another message, authenticity, self-advocation. Advocate for yourself. Yes. You know, you you shouldn't need to accept somebody else's baggage, and especially when you don't understand what it is that you're taking on, because that can be really hurtful for you personally. And judgment, I think. We Mm -hmm. can be too quick to judge based on other things that have happened for us that are going to be completely off the mark with what's happening with other people. So it's about reserving that judgment until you have the facts. And Yeah. I mean, I think the self-advocacy part, like speaking up for yourself, I feel like, first of all, that's really important because only you know what you need from other people and they can't know that. So the self-advocacy is so important because oftentimes someone's literally treating you the way that they want to be treated or the thing or the way that they think they need to treat you in order to get the results they want. Yeah. But I think the other part also is that storytelling, like when someone yells at you or does something that feels like it's wrong to you or others, it's easy to make up a story. And the shortcut story, Wendy, is often they're a bad person. They are a bully when really there's motivation behind that Mm. behavior. There's always motivation behind the behavior. It's difficult to have empathy when you're the victim. The empathy will help you resolve it though. Yes, yeah. Yeah. How many leaders do you suspect that you have had to kind of set the, reset the bar by saying, your team are not mind readers? I don't want to say how many. Because the number is going to be astounding. But I would say everyone needs to understand that their team cannot read their mind or the people can't read their mind. I think especially important for high profile leaders is because those other people can be hundreds or thousands and your decision determines how much they get paid or if they can take vacation or if they further their careers or get promoted in some way. So for those leaders, I say it to almost every one of them, even if it's not the most immediate thing or needed. I say it because what you decide, Mrs. CEO, determines the future of a hundred or thousands of people. So I say it to everyone. Yeah, that's all I'll say. I won't give a number. I don't. No, no, no. But I would guesstimate that we all do it. Yes. No, no matter whether we've got the training and the natural skill sets, even I do it. I do it with my husband. I do it with my daughter. I because I expect them to know better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hear this all the time. And when I'm talking to team members who have to manage up to their executives, they would say 
at her level, she should know this. At her level, she should know this. Or even the executive to the team letter, leaders, they would say at their level, they should know this. And I tell them should is an argument against reality. If they're behaving in ways that are not optimal for you, then you must tell them because obviously they don't know. Everyone wants to do their job well. Everyone wants to be liked. Everyone wants to do the morally right thing. Very few people go out and say, I want to be bad at this or I want to make my boss upset. Mm -hmm. So when you say they should know, should is an argument against reality. They don't know and they only need to be told. Yeah, or reminded because we're busy, we're humans, we're habitual creatures and, you know, we'll concentrate on what's important right now rather than maybe what we've learned before. I certainly know that things that I learned 30 years ago, I've been reminded of and forgotten that I do. You know, it's not until I've repeated that habit and gone, oh, I used to do that 30 years ago. Yeah. And it, it happens, doesn't it? Because things evolve and come around full circle. So it just never ceases to amaze me how the depth and breadth of conversation and interacting causes complication and such joy. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> well, Jay, thank you so much for sharing your story, your journey, your pivotal conversation. It's been an absolute pleasure to get to know you. If the listeners want to reach out and carry on the conversation, where's the best place for them to find you? They can find me at Jay Guilford Speaks. Reach me via email at contact at coworkslead.com. That's contact, C-O-N-T-A-C-T. The word contact at coworks lead, C O W O R K S L E A D dot com. Almost forgot my website. Got to get that right, Wendy. <laughs> well, look, we'll make sure that we put it in the show notes. It'll be on the website too. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Jay. All right. Thank you, Wendy. Have a great day. And you. And next week, we're joined by a professor who works at a university. Professor Kevin Singh is going to be talking to us about education. We'll be making conversations about education count. We design things that change the world, you know, even if that's someone's house. (laughs) 